He's a competitor. He's been very nice to me the times I've met him. I've been nice to him. He's a competitor, not a question of friend or enemy. He's not my enemy. And hopefully someday, maybe he'll be a friend. It could happen. But I, don't, I just don't know him very well. President Trump previewing his meeting with Vladimir Putin. He heads there to Helsinki to meet with Putin on Monday. This after a very contentious NATO summit in Brussels. You can see right now Brussels, the president departing there very shortly. He's heading here to the United Kingdom where I am. I'm in London. He has meetings scheduled with the British Prime Minister Theresa May as well as tea with the Queen tomorrow. Joining me now is the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Russia, India, Israel, Jordan, ambassador to the world, Thomas Pickering. <laughs> and also with us is Alistair Campbell. He was director of communications for former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. Uh, Ambassador, I would like to start with you with what we just saw from the president. You heard him talking about Vladimir Putin as a competitor. He wouldn't call him a foe. And then on the issue of election, election meddling, which I think is symbolic of his view toward Russia in general, he says, all I can say is, did you and don't do it again. Your takeaway. Nothing new there, uh, John. These have been the kind of soft touch of the, uh, of the president with respect to uh, President Putin. And in, in many ways, the strategic uh, framework within, within which all of this builds. Uh, the denigration of NATO, in effect, uh, the creation of real tensions within the alliance over a money issue, which in the end is probably going to end up exactly where it was when he began, even though he'd like to take personal credit for it. And a visit to the UK in which Clearly, there are troubles in the UK and with Mrs. May, and he hasn't shown much either sympathy or capacity to be helpful in underpinning the uh, particularly important relationship of our most stalwart traditional ally in Europe, uh, along with denigrating Germany. And so he has a capacity here to do a three-strike uh, uh, disaster uh, for American strategic interests in leading the world in keeping the European framework behind us. And Putin would be the icing on the cake. Uh, does he give away, in fact, Baltic exercises? Uh, does he undo uh, the kinds of things that are very important to us in maintaining uh, the relationship over the Ukraine and, and indeed Crimea? Uh, what does he get in return? It's a little bit like the Kim Jong-un time, uh, where he gives away U.S. exercises with the Republic of Korea with seemingly nothing in return except a smile from Kim. So we're in a situation in which seemingly U.S. interests and U.S. strategy is very much at stake, and the president seems to be very much motivated and continue to be by reality television and, and ego building, not a sense clearly of how and in what way the U.S. as leader of the world can continue to provide that kind of benign, helpful, cooperative, and indeed energetic and indeed progressive leadership that we have been known for and which he has over the, the last year and a half been undoing piece by piece. I want to fill in some of the context from what Ambassador Pickering just said. The president in this news conference would not rule out canceling joint NATO exercises in the Baltics. Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, so concerned about Russian expansion right now. There are NATO exercises planned. The president would not rule out canceling them if Vladimir Putin asked. The president would also not say uh, whether or not he would accept the annexation of Crimea. He wouldn't flat out say no on that. And on the NATO funding, the president held this entire news conference that we just saw moments ago, suggesting that he had secured pledges of increased spending from other NATO members uh, in their own defense. We haven't received confirmation of that from the NATO secretary general or, in fact, these other NATO nations. Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, said, that may not be the case. He just committed to the 2% that France always committed to spending by 2024. So just some context there. Alistair Campbell, former spokesman for British Prime Minister Tony Blair, is here with me in London. Again, the president due to arrive in the UK in, in about an hour. Back to Vladimir Putin for a second. I am curious, uh, from the standpoint of Europeans, from, from the standpoint of people in the UK, when you look at how the president deals with Vladimir Putin, what do you all see? Uh, we see a very strange relationship that seems to develop, that it developed before they even met, so far as we know. And I think we do, you know, I've got to be careful because I'm very much in the kind of anti-Brexit brigade and anti-Trump as well. But I think we do see it partly in that context of the meddling, 
as you called it in your introduction, that the, there is this sense of why is he so seemingly unwilling to criticise somebody that actually is, by any standards, uh, a figure of dictatorship rather than a figure of, of democracy. And I think partly I see somebody who is actually a little bit jealous of the dictator. You know, I, I see, I think most Brits, and as far as I know them, see Trump as a narcissist. It's all about him. I mean, even in that press conference where he said, they all, th they all said thank you to me. Well, they didn't. Mm -hmm. I know that. Uh, they didn't all say thank you to him. I think they were all a bit stunned by the way that he behaved this morning. And he said the thing about, you know, British people like me. Well, some might, but most don't. But it's all this sense of it's about him. And I agree with what the ambassador said. He's, he's still in this reality TV show. And he's projecting himself as the main star the whole time. Now, it's, it's very effective in terms of making himself the person. We're doing it now, the person the world talks about. And he loves that. But I agreed with every single word that the ambassador said there. In terms of securing what you imagine, what we imagine America's strategic interest to be, I don't think he's done that. And I think he's, what, he's, he's heading here. Those other leaders are all heading back to their countries, thinking, as George Bush said, that was some weird stuff. <laughs> Ambassador Pickering, that news conference we held, it was President Trump declaring victory in a way over America's greatest allies, which is interesting in and of itself, isn't it? It is because, in fact, they're the bedrock of the kind of relationship in the world that we would hope to create and press forward with. And making that uh, bedrock a transactional issue totally defined by percentages of money provided uh, in a situation in which others have clearly been working on that, but it becomes all about me and what I can achieve and how and in what way I can broadcast from this impromptu press conference the kind of victory I'd like to push uh, for myself uh, before the American people. And unfortunately, the American people don't like to get complicated with data and statistics mm -hmm. and complicated issues of that sort. And so he has a natural advantage in his experience in reality television in being able to push ahead with this kind of thing. But the clear question is, what are our strategic interests? How is he promoting those interests? And why and how uh, is that going to make uh, this a, a better country, a better community of allies and friends, and a better world for all of us. And I think he fails on all of those questions, and unfortunately not enough people are asking them. And we are at a critical stage mm. now uh, in the Trump presidency where, in fact, the foreign policy approaches of President Trump are clearly undermining the national interests of the United States, our friends and allies, and as I said a moment ago, the international community. And, and we should be very, very careful about this.